Coming up, the Mashpee Wampanoag are coming off a historic land back victory. We'll speak with Chairman Brian Whedon. Plus, what to watch at the virtual Sundance Film Festival and politics with Holly Cook Macaro. I am Aaliyah Chavez. Join us for those interviews plus headlines from the ICT newscast. The Walter Cronkite School of Journalism and Mass Communication at Arizona State University is honored to be a supporter of Indian Country Today. Working with award-winning professors, Cronkite students learn news reporting, social media, shooting and editing videos, and producing content for communications industries. Cronkite's 15 professional programs give students the opportunity to cover critical issues throughout the U.S. and beyond. Learn more at cronkite.asu.edu. This is the ICT Newscast with Aaliyah Chavez. Thank you for joining the ICT Newscast. Officials in the island nation of Tonga are still surveying the damage caused by the eruption of an underwater volcano. On Saturday, the volcano erupted violently, sending a plume of smoke and ash 12 miles into the sky. Satellite images caught the explosion, which was felt as far away as Alaska. A tsunami wave resulted from the blast as volcanic ash covered much of the islands. The Tongan government said it has confirmed three deaths. It said Tuesday that communication was down everywhere, which has made assessment of damage even more difficult. They also said there is no working equipment to tell if the volcano could erupt again. Other nations like New Zealand and Australia have sent aid and pledged money for recovery efforts. Tonga has been one of the few places in the world that has avoided COVID-19 outbreaks and now says it is being careful about an influx of aid workers. On Tuesday, the White House softly launched its website to order rapid COVID-19 tests. Americans can now visit covidtest.gov to secure free at-home tests. To order, you need to fill out a short form that includes your name and shipping information. Four tests will be sent to every residential address. While rapid tests are hard to come by, people in Indian country had concerns about limiting it to four tests per residence. Four tests per household doesn't acknowledge that um, you know certain racial and ethnic groups are more likely to live in multi generational homes. You know, so I think you know we'd really be considering you know eight tests per individual, twelve tests per individual, and really you know just what makes sense in terms of infrastructure and capacity. But we do know that public health infrastructure was really built around Indian country, um, so we're really catching up at a time where our communities really need assistance. For those who do not have reliable internet access, the Biden administration says it will set up a national hotline to order tests, but did not immediately provide a phone number. According to the United States Postal Service, the tests will ship 7 to 12 days after ordering. In Minnesota, the family of a 12-year-old girl is calling on her school to take action after they say a tutor directed racist comments at her. Anna Negretti is the mother of the girl. She told ICT that the incident started before Thanksgiving. A tutor allegedly scolded her daughter, saying her family should celebrate the holiday. Then, at the beginning of January, the same tutor at McGuire Middle School allegedly referred to Native Americans as, quote, savages who had killed her people. Negretti says she's worked with the school on a plan to keep the tutor away from her daughter, but wants more action. Because I want the message sent to other staff, they can't, they can't talk like that to young people. They can't use those those terms and still be okay. You know, our school says they want to be a diverse and inclusive community. Well, having a teacher or a staff person that uses that and still has a job sends the message to folks that that's still okay. The family says following the incident, the employee was moved from the tutor program to the library at the same Lakeville school. After weeks of delay, Brazil is beginning to vaccinate kids, and it began with one brave indigenous boy. Sao Paulo Governor João Doria stood next to the young indigenous Zavante boy who was the first to be vaccinated. Brazilian medics vaccinated 15 other children with him last week. 
The governor talked about the importance of this moment in the fight against the coronavirus. At eight years old, Davy will be the first Brazilian child ever to receive the Pfizer vaccination for his immunization, a historical moment for Brazil. This marks the start of an effort to vaccinate more children in the country. The boy's father, an indigenous leader, was on hand via video conference to watch his son make history. This is an example for children from 5 to 11 years old in the rest of Brazil. It's a campaign to save lives so that tomorrow we can have joy, we can smile. Health comes first. According to the country's Ministry of Health, Brazil has about 20 million children aged 5 to 11. And those are the headlines for the ICT newscast. Coming up, one tribe on the East Coast is working to become more economically independent while helping its citizens who are houseless. At the end of 2021, the Interior Department ruled that roughly 320 acres of Mashpee Wampanoag land will stay in its control. So now, after five decades, the nation is now the sole caretaker of more of its ancestral homelands near Cape Cod. Wampanoag Chairman Brian Whedon joins us to talk about the progress of his nation. Welcome, Chairman Whedon, and congratulations on this land bag victory. Katabatash, thank you, and Wanikisa, good day, everyone. So tell us how this uh, movement and this push to get your land back started. Um, this all started back in the 70s. Um, the Mashpee Wampanoag Tribal Council was formed because at the time we had seen a lot of developers moving into our ancestral territory um, and taking some of our lands that we used as common lands to hunt and fish and gather and exercise our Aboriginal rights and our sovereignty. Um, in the 70s, we sued the town of Mashpee for our land. And one of the reasons why we lost that case is because we were not federally recognized at the time. Uh, we were federally recognized in 2007. Um, so this has been a battle and a fight for well over, you know, 30 years that we've been working towards to restore some of our ancestral homelands. Um, so this is a start in the right direction um, to rebuilding um, our nation. When you found out about this ruling, what was your reaction? Um, the reaction was very bittersweet. Um, I thought about all of our ancestors and elders that uh, started that tribal council um, and the reason why you know, we have our connection to our land. Uh, when we introduce ourselves in our language, we say new Tomas and new Tomas literally means my blood and my bones is from this land. When you eat and you drink from the land, you are the land and the land is you. Um, and that's why we're proud to be Mashpee Wampanoag. Um, we're proud of coming from the Wampanoag Nation, but Mashpee is a special place. And so we think about all of our ancestors and all of our relations that have paid the ultimate sacrifice for us. So now that you have this land back, do you have any plans for it? I understand there might be a casino that could be built there. Um, the tribe is considering all economic development at this point. Um, a casino has been something that the tribe has trying to pursue for quite some time now. Um, the tribe and our administration is taking a look um, about how we're gonna move forward smart and strategically, um, whether that's class two, class three, um, as well as other economic development. We live on Cape Cod and we have a lot of tourism. Um, so I think we can also capitalize on the tourism. And I understand part of these initiatives also includes providing homes for those who don't have any. Yeah, so we have a problem here on the Cape, um, the income is driving a lot of our tribal citizens out of our ancestral territory where they're having to move to local cities. Uh, we have a large population in New Bedford, Massachusetts and Boston area. Um, and it's all because of the fact that they can't afford to live here. Uh, due to COVID, we have a big homeless uh, crisis going on right now, much as you know every other tribe across the nation. Um, and we actually have a shelter program with about four or five different motels and hotels with tribal members living in them. Uh, we live in multi-generational households, so you don't want younger people compromising our elders and so on and so forth. So the tribe plans on using some of our ARPA funds, and now that the land is in trust, to move forward with a homeless shelter in purchasing a facility. 
And so with all of these plans, it sounds like a casino, maybe maximizing on tourism and again, providing homes for the for those who don't have any. What is sort of the timeline of this entire project? Um, at this time, because we're back at the drawing board, we don't really have the answers for that. Um, if the tribe wanted to exercise our sovereignty and move full steam ahead, I think that we can ideally get something up and running in maybe a year. Um, tops. Um, but like we said, we're looking at all of our different approaches um, and how we're going to move forward strategically. I think in uh, Native communities, we're really hearing about this theme of land back. And that's this idea that advocates are pushing for a lot of ancestral homelands to be returned to their rightful owners. Given that you've just come off of this successful victory, do you have a message for other tribal nations who might be working in this pursuit right now? Yes, um, I want to tell everyone to just keep on the good fight uh, for all of our relations and all of our ancestors. Um, it's taken our tribe. We're the first contact tribe. Um, everyone wants to celebrate 400 years of the Wampanoags and the Pilgrims and this Thanksgiving, this mythical, you know, gathering and harvest that we had, which isn't true and accurate. Um, and 400 years later, we only received half of 1% of our ancestral territory. We have a deed from the King of England that gives us 50 square miles never to be sold um, or alienated unless the whole tribe consented. Um, but instead, the Commonwealth of Massachusetts and the federal government forced citizenship upon us. Um, so we plan on restoring more of our ancestral homelands. This is just a drop in the bucket. And I understand this 320 acres, there's actually a possibility that um, people opposing having your land back could potentially reopen a new lawsuit to block it and reverse the, the decision. What will the tribe do in that situation? Um, the tribe plans on exercising our sovereignty. Um, you know, we've been at war with the federal government and, uh, you know, the colonists for over 400 years. Um, so I'm not really worried, nor is the tribe I'm worried about any kind of lawsuits at this point in time or fighting anyone like we've been doing over the past couple of years. Um, you know, this is a long fight that we've had and we'll continue to fight until we can get what's rightfully ours. Well, Chairman, thank you so much. Katapitash, thank you. Coming up, Adam Perone fills us in on all the Indigenous films at Sundance this year. The Sundance Film Festival is back to online this year, but that doesn't stop the Indigenous film community from getting excited. Fifteen Indigenous projects are scheduled for this year. Joining us today is Adam Perone. He's the Sundance Institute's Indigenous Program Interim Director. Hi, Adam. So tell us about this year's lineup. Yeah. Hi. Thanks for having me. Um, yeah. So we, we have... Um, one feature film, uh, five short films, and about three, um, what we call sort of like our new frontier exper experiences, which are a mix of VR uh, and uh, AR experiences. So they'll be accessible through um, through our, our online platform. All of these films, as you had mentioned, we'll be um, doing our festival virtually this year. And so, yeah, all of these will be available on the platform. I know um, all of the shorts have their own uh, individualized Q and A's as well as um, the feature film as well. And I know there'll be some events around some of the new frontier events um, too. And um, yeah, one of the things that we also do during our, our festival run is we have what we call our native form celebration, which is um, highlighting not only all of the, the films and the filmmakers uh, that are indigenous at the festival, but we also um, highlight all of our fellows that are also participating. So these are people from, um, across the year that we've supported. So it's, um, you know, we have some artists working on feature film scripts as well as uh, episodic works. Uh, and we also have our new Frontier Fellows, which are um, indigenous youth that are interested in looking at film as a career path um, from New Mexico, Michigan, and uh, Mississippi. And um, we also, which is sort of like our, one of our, our main highlights that we have at the, the celebration is that we announce our Meritamita Fellow, which is, um, a fellow, uh, it's a fellowship that's been uh, named in honor of Meritamita, who is the um, the first Maori, um, really the first indigenous woman to, um, or sorry, Maori uh, filmmaker, um, who was a woman who uh, to solely direct a film on her own. 
Um, so it's a, um, a fellowship that um, supports uh, indigenous artists who identify as women uh, working on their first feature film. And so we'll announce uh, this year's fellow uh, for that. I'm sure we'll all look forward to that. I'd love to hear about Cousin. Tell us about that. Um, yeah, um, so Cousin is um, a collective that I started um, working, uh, it was co-founded with um, Sky Hopinka, Alexandra Lazarovich, and Adam Khalil. And we work with uh, indigenous filmmakers who um, are working a bit more in the experimental space, um, mostly around the moving image. So there is a mix of short films, feature films, uh, some installation works as well. So really exciting. Of all of the films and all of the um, programming that you just mentioned, I'd be really curious, what stands out to you personally? What should we be looking for? Um, I think, I, I mean, in all honesty, I would check them all out. I think one of the things that we really uh, pride ourselves on, not, not only within um, the Indigenous program at Sundance, but also within a lot of the programming for the festival in and of itself, are really strong voices from Indigenous communities. I think the, these are stories that um, you're not going to see anywhere else. I think that it, they're highlighting a lot of artists, um, you know, I, I think that are sort of on, on the rise to a certain extent. Um, you know, some of the alumni of our program are people you might know, like, you know, Taika Waititi, uh, Sterling Harjo, um, you know, we've supported Sky Hopinka in the past, um, Lyle Corbine uh, Jr., who uh, did a film called Wild Indian that was in the festival last year as well, too. Um, you know, and a number of other uh, filmmakers as well, too, you know, throughout the years that I've also had work that have uh, played at Sundance and have gone on to to do um, other things and a lot of them that are working in, in TV as well, too. So, you know, we're really proud of not only our alumni, but also, you know, I think what our, our program does as well, too, which is, um, you know, really, really looking for original voices from, you know, many different uh, communities across not only the U.S., but uh, internationally as well. So. That's something that has always stood out to me, too. I think that um, Sundance really uses this idea of indigeneity on a global perspective, right? Like we see Native Americans, but as you mentioned, Taika Waititi is Maori. And so I think there's a number of indigenous um, creatives behind this program. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I think it's, you know, it's um, really going back to it's it's been um, a charge of really since the beginning of the the program uh, when it started back when Robert Redford founded the Sundance Institute we um you know he wanted to create a place for indigenous voices specifically working in film and I really think you know um with our former director um uh, Bird Running Water I think he was really able to um to really sort of supercharge the program in a way that was making it a lot more internationally focused as well too. I mean, I shouldn't say focus, our focus is within the US, but I mean, really sort of expanding it internationally as well. Um, so I think really under his vision, you know, I think our, our program has, um, has really gone to a new height that wasn't there before, but I think also we've been able to, um, you know, highlight a lot of these voices that are out there. Um, and, you know, I, I think, give them support. And, you know, I think our, we're, I think we're really good at not only letting our artists and their work speak for themselves, but also really providing them with different opportunities or at least connecting them with different uh, potential um, routes into either the industry or either their own practice with uh, wherever they choose to go. So. And how can folks at home uh, tune in and, and join you all? Yeah, um, you know, definitely check out Sundance's website. Um, there are information, there's information there on uh, ticket packages or individual uh, tickets as well. Uh, they'll uh, connect you to our platform. And, um, and yeah, so, you know, it's definitely something to check out. I know that the feature films um, are, they're operating much in a similar way that if you were going to a festival where they have very sort of like specific time, times that they are playing for, for limited times, um, I, the short films and the new frontier pieces are available throughout the festival. So you can access, you can watch the short films whenever you want. Uh, same thing with the, uh, the VR pieces as well too. Adam, thank you so much. Thank you. And we'll be right back.
it has been a tough first year for the Biden administration, and his approval ratings show it. Holly Cook Macaro from Spirit Rock Consulting joins us to tell us what's next. Hi, Holly. Good morning, Aaliyah. It's good to see you. You too. So tell us, what do you think is next? When we're reflecting on the Bi- on President Biden's first year in office, what are we taking away from it? Tomorrow is the one-year anniversary, January 20th. It's when he was sworn in as President of the United States, and we are going to be hearing a lot um, in what I, I call the mainstream media about the Biden presidency one year in. I think overall there are concerns about the state of President Biden's legislative agenda, his his falling poll numbers, which some people place a lot of value in, some folks don't. Um, He's dealing with the repeated waves of the COVID spikes, inflation, and um, everyone, I think, is wondering what what the administration's next steps will be after after the push with Build Back Better as we went into the holiday season, and then what we've seen over the last couple of weeks on voting rights, which um, we don't expect to um, see passed today, but there will be some action in the Senate. So those are those are very serious points. Um, a, a lot of discussion around those. I don't think this is where the Biden administration wanted to be one year in. But um, and, and I and I'll say that for for mainstream America, I think for Indian country, a one year review is is a different picture. We have seen um, right out of the gate when President Biden signed the American Rescue Plan, which con- contained the largest single. Uh, federal investment in Indian country, over $30 billion in the American Rescue Plan. Um, that was, an un- and the administration and the buildup and the negotiations and getting to that number and including those funds in the bill, it was a sea change for us, uh, for Indian country. We didn't have that kind of support from the Trump administration in, in, in the negotiations for the CARES Act, which contained $8 billion for tribes. So, so having that support from the administration and in partnership with our other champions on the Hill, um, really that, that resulted in that historic investment. So we, we have, um, in addition to that, we, we had in November the Infrastructure and Jobs Act, which contained um, another, um, I think it was thirteen billion dollars for tribes, and um, and with other funds available in different pots as well. So when we look at overall what's happening um, in the administration for Indian Country, and I, I think what we see first is is his partnership with Secretary Holland. Her voice and influence in this administration is clear, uh, much as it was in in her two terms in the House. The um, They've taken the action to restore and protect uh, Bears Ears um, and and other national monuments. They've worked in partnership with tribes on climate change issues. We have um, two nominations to the federal bench. One is confirmed, one is nominated. And I know others are in active consideration as well. Those are important, uh, I think, accomplishments um, those like hard accomplishments that we can point to in Indian country for this one year in. Holly, what do you say to the disgruntled native voter who might not want to vote in the midterms this year? What do you say to them? Well, <laughs> and what we're looking at and hearing about today is the Biden administration, right? The one year review in. Um, and, and when we but so we can look at all of those accomplishments that I just outlined. But for the midterm voter who is looking at um, what's been left on the table in terms of voting rights legislation, uh, the funds in the Build Back Better that that contain some very critical programs for Indian country as well, um, that can be frustrating. But I think that that um, the Native American voter looking at the midterms, I think we we look at at the long game here and what the priorities are for this administration and the engagement for what an administration can do, um, you know, on its own through executive action but also look at those who can be supportive. Look at those who are supportive and in the right place on tribal issues. President Biden is sort of seen as the leader of the Democratic Party. As we're entering into this election year, what do you think that because of all of President Biden's policy agenda pushes, what do you think that that signals for Democrats up and down the ballot? Well, I think we need to um, get get some some marks in the in the win column here. And uh, there's a lot of a lot of uh, what do we call that armchair quarterbacking going on? You know, is 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 the president has he swung too far left? 
Does it need to be more of a centrist agenda? Um, how can we best position the Democratic Party um, to, for those down ballot effects going into the midterms? We have a number, and it seems as we see more every day. Um, um, I think we may have hit over 30 Democratic House retirements. Some of those are in are in Democratic leaning districts, but um, so safe districts is is what I mean. But um, it's going to be a, a tough race for for the Democrats to hold this to hold the House. We and without a fully democratic Congress, um, I think the path forward for President Biden and, and his legislative agenda, whatever that may be as we move forward, is going to be even more difficult. Although it doesn't see, I think the, the all democratic governance that, that the party and the president envisioned um, in, a year ago when, when um, he was sworn in, I don't think that has um, played out. You know, the, the failed relationship management basically with, with uh, Senator Manchin and Senator Cinema, that needs to be reset and restarted in order to see any any real successes with the Biden legislative agenda. And we'll of course watch that going forward. As I said, we entered this election year. Holly, thank you so much. Yes, thank you, Aaliyah. And that's a slice of our Indigenous world. Thank you for watching. For all the latest news and updates, visit us anytime at IndianCountryToday.com. I am Aaliyah Chavez. Sometimes you got to take a step. Just because you know you can't, oh, you got to run, you got to run.